I'm Nick Ravellis, the host of UCSD TV's Opera Talk and the Geisel Director of Education and Outreach for San Diego Opera. My passion is helping people understand opera and come to love it as much as I do. At San Diego Opera, my colleagues and I do that in many different ways, but one of my favorite events is the Artists Roundtable. The San Diego Opera Artists Roundtable is an intimate look at an exciting art form. I invite the principal artistic team for each production here to the Beverly Sills Salon for a freewheeling discussion before a live audience that covers everything from the music to the motivations of the characters to the director's stage vision and sometimes even a penetrating look at a singer's career. There is never a dull moment and it's one of the joys of my job that I get to moderate these discussions. I think you'll enjoy it too. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Artists' Roundtable for Giuseppe Verdi's Nabucco. Uh, this is the first time we've performed Nabucco in ooh, about 28 years, something like that. It's been a very, very long time. I'm one of those people who remembers the last time that we did it. Are any others in the, in the audience? Because it was wonderful, and it's so delightful to have the opportunity to see and hear this opera uh, one more time. We're all very, very excited. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel. Uh, directly on my right, singing the role of Abigail, was last year, last with us last year, uh, singing Tosca, uh, soprano from France, Sylvie Valère. Our Nabucco, uh, standing in for an indisposed singer, literally at the last minute. Uh, I think he got the call about a week before we started rehearsals, uh, is the baritone Richard Paul Fink. <laughs> we'll talk. <laughs> now, and I am, I am very privileged to introduce to you an actual descendant of the king who freed the Jews <laughs> 50 years after the Babylonian exile. And uh, of course, that being Cyrus the Great, well, here is our own Cyrus, who is the stage director, Latfi Mansouri. <laughs> it's the Persian connection. Um, and next to him, um, singing the role of Fanena, I believe last year, singing uh, uh, two years ago, singing. Wozzeck, in, in Wozzeck, not singing Wozzeck, but she was in, <laughs> in Wozzeck. Uh, Margaret, the role of Margaret, I believe, that's right. And this is our, our dear friend, soprano, Susanna Poretsky. <laughs> Making his debut with us uh, in the role of Fanena's uh, boyfriend, for lack of a, of a better word, fiance, uh, lover. Uh, Ismaele is tenor Arthur Shen. And finally, in the pivotal role of the high priest of the, of the uh, Israelites, uh, Zachariah, bass Raymond Decetto. So I'd like to begin uh, with this distinguished panel simply by talking about the roles, the, the, I don't think that the plot is terribly complicated, and you probably know the, the basic thing that you need to know is, of course, that, that the deep background of the opera is about the Babylonian exile, Nebuchadnezzar II, Nabucco in the opera, uh, has come to Jerusalem, has challenged the Israelites and their leaders, and abducts 30 or 40,000 of um, the leaders of the Israelites and abducts them, takes them to Babylon, and they are there in exile for 40 or 50 years. There is, of course, a love triangle in the midst of all this, because after all, this is Italian opera. You know, you've got to, you've got to have a foreground story that's about love and about passion. So I'd like to start with Sylvie and just talk a little bit about Abigail, <laughs> what makes her tick, who is she, uh, and what is her role in the story? Well, I have a previous question. 
before I will answer this one. Sure. Uh, don't you have love triangle elsewhere than Italy? <laughs> sure, but they're so good at it. <laughs> no, I feel much better. French. Yeah. <laughs> I am a French, I am French, a little bit. <laughs> Just a little bit. But not too much. <laughs> so, what? Abigail, eh? Abigail. She's a kind of baddie. She's a kind of, yeah, baddie. But she's very unhappy. You know, she really, she, she thinks she is the daughter, daughter of the king, the elder one, and she realizes she's not. And she is even uh, the daughter of slaves, so that when she realizes that, that she will never get the throne for herself, she is quite, let's say, ill at ease, not to say more. <laughs> and then she, she, and before that, she realizes that the guy she's in love with is in love with his younger sister. Her S younger sister. Uh, her youngest, yeah, well, you know, I play a warrior. <laughs> you, know, you know, with this stuff, I don't even know what I am anymore because I'm supposed to be a warrior and behave like a guy and stuff, so I have like uh, personality problems <laughs> right now. Mm. She's like an Italian Brunhilde, perhaps. Jawohl! <laughs> <laughs> And the challenges of the role are considerable. Well, not as much as Brunehilde. <laughs> <laughs> not as much. Yeah, well, it's, it's not really easy, but it's, it's typical uh, Verdi, mm, dramatic coloratura, stuff like that, or like the, the, the mm, heritage from uh, Donizetti and Bellini, Norma, this, this kind of characters that are uh, heroic and uh, but a little disturbed, mm -hmm. <laughs> mentally disturbed, and so the way it's written in the music is al also very obvious of that. That she she climbs very high, high notes, and then she she sings very low notes, and she shouts, and sometimes, poetry she manages to sing, <laughs> uh, but uh, yes, yeah, she's crazy, <laughs> definitely. Let's talk to the man she loves just uh, for, for a moment. Uh, Arthur I is singing the role of Ismaele, and he's at the center of the love tri triangle, although he never returned Abigail's love, well, or at least well, I assume not. That's natural. I mean, sorry, the younger woman is not naturally more appealing for the tenor. <laughs> 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 and I wouldn't say that she's crazy. I would say that she has uh, suffering from some personality disorder, perhaps. That's what I said. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So how about Ismaele? Who is, who is he and uh, what is his role in the story? Uh, Ismaele is, um, well, he has his own set of problems, of course. Um, but he represents, um, I, I believe, uh, he represents pure love and that it's a purity. Um, I, I, Abigail has, blind, has nearly blind ambition um, and so uh, uh, Ismael represents uh, more of the, the purity of love in this particular instance. And, uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but, but he has his own sets of problems because he is the, the captain of the, uh, of the Hebrew army and, um, and has risen through, not necessarily by merit, I mean, he is the uncle of the, um, uh, I mean, his uncle is, uh, was, was the leader. So um, it wasn't necessarily by merit. Well, and, um, and we must say from the, from the beginning, he's a good Jewish boy. Exactly. And he's fallen in love with Fenena, who is a good Babylonian girl. Yes, so that's, uh, yeah. this is his first problem, I should think. <laughs> yes, and it, it comes to a, a major problem in the opera when um, he has to decide between his love or his country, uh, mm -hmm. which is a, always a wonderful storyline. And he chooses for his love and becomes disgraced among the Jews. And so he, uh, but he uh, enjoys a, a wonderful redemption um, in, in uh, s successive scenes, uh, thanks to uh, good old <laughs> Zachariah here, and <laughs> yeah, and, and Fenena, uh, of course, yes. Okay, and, and Susanna, you are the love interest for Ismaele. You are the sister, stepsister, half-sister, Fenena? No sister. No sister, not at all I a sister. Find out, no, because, uh, 
Of course, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, she is the real daughter of Nabucco. Right. right. The royal daughter. So you are the princess in a, in, in a sense. Yeah. Well, of course I am. <laughs> <laughs> Well, then explain a little bit of that to us, because it is a complicated relationship. Tell us who Banana is and what she's about in the army. She's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she is the real daughter of Nabucco. Uh, she, is, uh, she, she doesn't have to do anything to gain love, Nabucco's love or uh, Ismaeli love or love of Jewish people. And she converts at the end. She converts. She became one of the Jewish. And uh, I forgive her at the end. Thank you. <laughs> Perhaps because uh, I'm getting tanner. <laughs> <laughs> and Zachariah is the high priest. You have some, um, I think, um, interesting relationships with everybody in this, in this show. Uh, how do you describe Zachariah's character? Well, he is the uh, head of the uh, Israelis. He's the religious head of the Israelis, but he's also the, sort of the, uh, uh, the leader. And um, the way I look at Zachariah is um, he is truly a, a, a rock amongst his people, and no matter what his people endure, and they've endured quite a bit, he always stays focused, he always stays, stays centered, and he always stays true to his religious convictions and his, his, his strength, and that is his strength. Um, he always seems to be uh, calming people down when people are in despair or trying to raise their spirits when they're in despair, which I like to look at uh, Zachariah as somewhat of what Verdi's music did uh, in Italy in this time um, after the Napoleonic era, they call what's known as the Risorgimento, was the, the, the bringing uh, the national pride back to Italy. And uh, Nabucco was a, was a huge vehicle for that. It was a very patriotic piece. So, um, you know, I, the things that I say could be transferred to almost any culture or any religion. Um, you know, faith in God, trust yourselves, you know, rise up, try not to let, you know, for, to, to dumb, it, dumb it down, don't sweat the small stuff, you know. <laughs> it's going to be okay. And I have three arias in which I say that in three different ways. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, uh, purposely left Richard, um, left you for last because everybody in the opera has to react to you. I but put the fun in dysfunctional. <laughs> you, you really are. And, uh, and you have a rather amazing arc in this show as well as a character. Tell us about Nabucco himself. Uh, of course, Nabucco, the warrior king, comes in very strong-willed, very dynamic, and uh, it immediately sets the stage. You go to prison, you die, that's it. Um, it's cut and dried. And then becomes, over the course of the opera, he, he gets so filled with his own lust for power and his own desires and his own ego that uh, declaims himself, himself God. I am, a, I am not just a king, I am a god. And um, Zachariah prays uh, the Lord to, to have justice, and the Lord strikes him dumb, basically. Uh, and Nabucco is there, but has totally been ta taken to the opposite extreme. He then becomes the, uh, the handicapped person, um, the person who can't see what is happening in front of him all the time. But um, even in his state, he has another view on the world that so many people don't. Uh, that he can still, he has a perception, wonderful perception of the world. And then through the tauntings of Abagaila and everyone around him, that he then, uh, is, he's imprisoned and is uh, given a vision by God of how Banana, his beloved daughter, and everyone else will be imprisoned and treat, mistreated, uh, the pain that they will suffer, and the, the scales are taken from his eyes, uh, metaphorically, and he, he becomes, again, uh, he, he offers himself to God 
uh, in a prayer, in a wonderful prayer, and says, please, please forgive me. I will personally, I will rebuild the temple. I will unify the country. I will bring everyone back together. And uh, I think the key line at the end is, then if, if you can do these things, if you can become these things, you will truly become the king of kings. So the transformation from the, where I have to travel from at the very beginning through the insanity and back out the other side again to a man who's been redeemed uh, it's just an incredible acting journey. Mm -hmm. it, re it, it really is. And, and I, I, I've been saying all along, it's sort of fascinating to, to, um, to view an opera like this about the Israelites versus the Babylonians, and, and at the end, everybody converts to Judaism. You know, the entire cast. It's, it's, it's really <laughs> fascinating. Um, Latfi, is, is this piece then about power and redemption? Well, it's about so much. I mean, you cannot just say that uh, because uh, I, I love this opera. Mm. It was Verdi's very first big, big hit. And it's just, uh, the only word that I can describe it is just it's so hot mm -hmm. from beginning. And it's magnificent characters, all of them these personalities. And they all, I mean, the one word that has become such a cliche, to use, uh, they all have their own personal journeys. They really do. I think Richard very beautifully now described his Nabucco's journey of what he went through. And Abigail was a fascinating character, fascinating because she is totally doesn't belong anywhere. She, she's been adopted, and she finds out that it, even her parentage it was not clear, and etc. And she wanted the power. She l loses the one man she loves, etc. But yet at the same time. She then learns also to forgive and ask for forgiveness. So all of them, uh, uh, Fenena, for example, when she's held captive as a hostage uh, by the Hebrews, because being the daughter of Nabucco, hopefully that would help, she makes a complete uh, journey. All of a sudden, seeing Zachariah and seeing his honesty and the depth of his humanity and all that, she then converts. Uh, and, and she becomes a, a Hebrew. So it's a, as for a stage director, it's a wonderful piece. It's a, and I like to think that it's very much like some of the earlier Shakespearean war plays, that these wonderful characters and having these tremendous, tremendous kind of personal reactions and adventures and all that. So. Uh, and the chorus, by the way, I have to say a word about chorus. Oh, please, I was going to ask I'm, you about I, the chorus, actually. Yeah, I am very prejudiced. I think the San Diego Opera has one of the best choruses I've ever worked with. They, <laughs> they, they care so much. They really do, and they understand their function. And here, of course, they have a very, very difficult task. They have to portray two completely different uh, communities and, and uh, the Babylonians, of course, and their decadence and etc., and the Hebrews, the, the beautiful faith and the simplicity and the honor and all that, and the choruses. One, and, and that because of this opera, actually, Verdi got a title. Mm. Uh, he was then he became known in the same Italian, Padre del Coro, the father of the chorus. Because if you think all of a sudden, chorus in his operas is so important. So important when you look down, you know, Don Carlos and you know all the others is, is fabulous. So well, if you just look at recorded um, uh, history. You know, you can always find a record or a, a CD. Listen to me, of uh, of highlights of choral music from Verdi. I don't know of one <laughs> from, oh. of choral highlights from Rossini or Bellini or, or Donizetti. No, because actually it was Verdi that uh, kind of developed. Yeah. the function of the chorus as a dramatic function. The other one were kind of like um chick, um yeah. chick, um chick. You know, but I mean, like, just, the, just the way Nabucco begins, the opera yeah. begins, the chorus is just white hot Very at the hot. beginning yeah. of this thing. It's, it's wonderful uh, writing. No, it's so I, f exciting. I find that of all of his operas, I mean, excuse me, let's talk about Otello, mm -hmm. not, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, so I think that it's, it's a, uh, I hope that it's going to be a great discovery for you. First of all, we have this wonderful cast, and uh, they, it's a fabulous opera, and the characters are all very interesting. 
And what's incredible about Verdi, that uh, he, I happen to have a couple of gods in my operatic Valhalla, and of course one of them is Verdi. He always finds the truth mm. in of the humanity, the emotional truth in every character. So for a kind of a, a stage director, it's really a great pleasure and a great honor. Mm. Um, there are three characters in this opera, um, uh, Nabucco, of course, Abigail, and I, I believe Zacharia, where I can feel Verdi moving in new directions against what had been given to him by the bel canto composers in the past. I think this is one of the reasons that he, he often took it on the chin from critics as well as other composers uh, that, uh, that didn't like his very direct and very, appro uh, a very uh, fresh approach, uh, sometimes brutal approach to music, depending on the character that he was trying to describe. I'm gonna start with Zachariah, because do, do you feel, as I do, that um, this, is, this is a step away from the typical basso role in Italian opera up to this point, that the basso was often given the role of an old man, or the role of an old king, or, the, or a buffa role. Mm -hmm. But uh, Zachariah, to me, is, is unique, and I wonder if you experience the same. Um, what I find amazing about the role, and challenging as well, is uh, there are three arias, and each of the arias are in differing style. Um, the first aria, the opening aria, is a um, beautiful cantabile aria um, with the chorus and uh, with uh, two verses of the cabaletta. The cabaletta is um, sort of the uh, fast portion after uh, after you get the slow, but to, to, to simplify it the best I can. Um, the third aria, right after the Va Pensiero, is another one where he's coming in and, and trying to bring his, his, his people back up and, and, and tell them to have faith in God. And, and both of the first and the third are uh, in similar styles. The third one, I think, more goes to what you're saying about where he's heading com composition-wise. The second aria, the preghiera, the prayer, to me, is the aria that really separates the men from the boys. It is not high, it is not long, it is not loud, it is not dramatic. What it is, is and it is these absolute most beautiful legato lines that are very long and very uh, mellifluous. How do, you, how do you describe that aria? And uh, that, to me, is, is, is where you have to be virtuosic as a singer. And so the first and the third aria are doable to those who aren't so virtuosic. The, the second aria and the accompany, accompaniment is next to nothing. It's just a vocal line, a long, beautiful vocal line. And those who can sustain it and those who can carry it and those who can... You, with you know, with the breathing and the and the that's to me, what makes like you said, all of a sudden now the bass is more than just, you know, the third uh, third dude from the left. Yeah, and and well, and with those given those three arias, um, the basso, at least Zacharia, the basso Zacharia, uh, is in my mind, young. Um, a vibrant character, a very, um, not an old man at all. No. I, think it's, I think it's wrong, I think, when, when he's portrayed that way. Mm -hmm. he may, he's, he's certainly a leader and he's revered. He's a, a rabbi, perhaps, but mm -hmm. we don't have rabbis yet uh, in this period. But um, he, um, he's, he's just a character who is so full of life, unlike base characters that at least I'm aware of prior to that. But Verdi was very much influenced by the opera Moses. I was going to talk I, to you no, about the yeah, very Moses much and because, and I think Zachariah is quite a bit like Moses. They had, they had, and, and but now Moses, if, at least as I recall, Mose in Egito. This is Rossini, by the way, 1818. Uh, so it's 
a number of years. This is like 30 before, years before. But he loved the number one, he loved the character. And so I always feel a little bit of a kind of this association between Zachariah and Moses. But does he not and only Moses have... also uh, was the, because of course, I always, I, I, you know, with Ray, Said, I mean, just think of Charlton Heston. I mean, you know, and <laughs> <laughs> because also in that wonderful film, Charlton Heston was not old. I mean, you know, he was powerful, right. etc. And and the Moses was a leader, and so was Zachariah. So there's an incredible proximity mm -hmm. from uh, uh, from Zachariah to Moses, that uh, man who leads his his tribes and his all his people to freedom. But Moses only has one aria, as I recall. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's a little, totally, a little different. <laughs> I, I, I absolutely agree with you that, that Zachariah should not be played as a um, what we call a basso in toga, you know, old man yeah. in a robe. Uh, he he can't be. He wouldn't work that way. Uh, and the music suggests that. Uh, you know, um, the music is very heroic and very. I don't want to say youthful, but I, but but powerful in a in a physical way. Mm -hmm. Do you know where? Um, you, you can't, he, he couldn't be that. I mean, obviously, he, he's, I'm sure, older than pretty much everybody else. You know, just the nature of his uh, stature. But he's definitely strong. He's definitely a warrior. He's, he, he pulls a knife out and threatens to kill Fenene right in front of her father. <laughs> he definitely has, I believe, moxie is the term. <laughs> we can use the word cojones. We're so <laughs> close to the or border, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Chutzpah is a, a, another Italian word. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sylvie, yes, sir. Let's, let's talk about, um, again, it just along the same lines, that a, a kind of a breakaway, in a sense, from earlier uh, models of soprano heroines. Um, Abigail, for instance, has a double aria. The first half of that aria could have been written by Bellini or Donizetti. Well, it, it's, but the second it's, half is something completely different. I don't agree with you. No? I think it's very close to, to, uh, to Norma. Really? Yes. Even in terms of all the wide leaps and the angular well, kind melodic of, writing? Yeah. Kind of, if you think of the character of Norma mm -hmm. and the end of the first act and the duet with Polione, mm -hmm. I see it very close. So this is a, you see a Bellini model in, in it, Bellini in, the role. in Norma, mm -hmm. not in Puritani. Si, si. Eh. Mm -hmm. Not in uh, Sonambula. <laughs> no, not certainly not Sonambula. No, but she, she could be a Sonambula in the way Lady Macbeth would be. Yeah. But, <laughs> but uh, no, she, she's very close to, uh, I think, yes, to a, a character like Norma and people like that, mm -hmm. yes. And later, li like a few years later, mm -hmm. uh, five years later, f four, uh, Lady Macbeth. Yeah. This is almost a sketch for Lady Macbeth in a way. Yes, musically, yes. Absolutely, but uh, but Lady Macbeth is much more interesting. <laughs> Lady Macbeth is yes, and yeah. the way it's written, especially the uh, the 1865 revision for Paris, with the uh, La Luce Langue, the second act aria of Lady Macbeth, it's something just amazing. But she's not bad, Abigail. She's a good baddie. <laughs> okay, but you look like no. I just want to. I mean, Silvia also has another role in a repertoire, which is quite a bit, like Abigail is Odabella yes. from Attila, because also that's another early Verdi opera, which is magnificent, also, again, for a bass, heroic bass. And so, and Odabella's tessitura and the music and all that is quite a bit like Abigail. Mm. Yeah. The, all these jumps you're talking about, the uh, mm -hmm. fiorituras and all that kind of stuff. It's exactly in between, uh, Odabella is in between Navigaille and Lady Macbeth. Mm. Right, exactly. Yeah. But she's not a baddie for once. <laughs> no, no, and, and she doesn't die. No, she kills. I mean, kind of. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm used to that. Yeah. <laughs> Richard, how about Nabucco? Do you see uh, an inkling of the true Verdi baritone in this role? I certainly hope so. I mean, <laughs> every, I've gotten, you know, people say, oh, well, you're too Wagnerian, you, you don't, you know, you just, it's only, you know, it's what you do. Um, no, I've, I've done so many of Verdi's works 
over the over the years. Yes, you've done that, Macbeth, so you, you could compare it to Macbeth. The, I I see a lot of the foreshadowings of a lot of the things. Um, I think we were talking earlier about the music styles. Uh, he in this piece is so relies on the ABA style of composition, where you take a theme, put in another theme, then develop the original. You take the same the the first theme or develop it or turn it into something else. And we have several duets that are that way. Um, even within even within our duet scene, we do two duets that are basically constructed of that same function. But yeah, the um, the Verdi baritone. Uh, he's he, I think he's just starting to discover the joys of writing for the uh, for the Verdi baritone, and especially especially near the end, and that the heroicness of the uh, the her uh, at near the end when. Uh, after the prison scene, at the end of the prison scene, when uh, when Nabucco discovers himself, then you start seeing the true heroism come out, and you can hear it and feel it in the music. Mm -hmm. That's one of the great things about Verdi's music, is you can always, he's such a dramaturg, you can always feel that, that mood setting and that energy, but then he lets you, as a singer, he puts you right, right where you need to be. And he was so talented, so very early on, that every singer, or I think, is is right where they need to be at a given time, at a, in a, in their vocal range. It's not like you're trying to scream up at a scream something up at a high note or or being covered by the by the orchestra at a low spot. There, it's all right there, and it's mm -hmm. so wonderful. And he lets you soar. He does. He really does. Mm -hmm. um, Arthur and Susanna, you have uh, what purports to be a duet. At, in Act One, which is then rudely interrupted by Abigail, as usual. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Arthur, first you. This is um, um, it's sort of interesting that the tenor doesn't have an aria in this in this opera. The tenor is not um, uh, uh, subsidiary or compromario at all. I mean, this is a it's it's a major role, but no aria. Is it is it uh, difficult to create? the character without an aria, without having a, a moment where you're reflecting on who you are and what you feel? Uh, not particularly, no. Um, I think based on some of my experience, I've done other works where I haven't had necessarily arias to uh, make a, you know, a firm statement as to the character's intent or the character's mm -hmm. development. So. But I would say that the first couple of times I had to do those kinds of pieces, sure, it was a bit difficult. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, I, I think if one buys into the model of like a, the sort of the stereotypical singer who is, you know, only wants to sing their aria and their high notes, which many, many tenors could be guilty of, <laughs> um, uh, then sure, one could say that. But mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, uh, one can find beautiful and intensive moments in uh, one phrase uh, in, in, a, in a recitative or, uh, or sometimes even in the silence of a pausa. Uh, so yeah, I, uh, yeah, I try to make the best of what you have. And the music is, I mean, this is Verdi. It's, it's so human, it's so, it's uh, well. It, it touches me very dearly, and uh, I'm, I'm hope it touches all of you very, very dearly as well. Well, and you do have a moment of uh, confrontation with the chorus, which is oh uh, yeah, right, very right. exciting. I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a that's that that's kind of moving a little bit toward the you know one could say the spinto uh, parts for the, for mm -hmm. the tenor. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, one, one could Where say it becomes that. more of a soloist, more of a yeah, exactly. For yeah. Tenor. yeah. There was a time in American musical comedy when we we went from a more music hall type story to a through composed work, where they went from just presenting a show where you had a, a group of pearls strung together, just a group of songs. Then came a, an era in, in our era in time when all of a sudden the, the songs, the arias, became developmental. They they moved the story along and opera years before went through the exact same process that we, we went we were going from a time period of 
we had a little aria. We have an aria, a gl- cute little aria with maybe some chit, ch- and then chit chat, <laughs> and then another aria to show off the voice, and then a little chit chat. This piece is one of the first pieces that, sure, it has a foot in the old world a little bit, but the arias, the songs, move the story along. They, every, it, the arias are only there to move the plot, mm-hmm. I think. Mm. Um, beautiful ensemble. And as well. Beautiful, beautiful ensemble. Yeah, I mean, actually, <clears throat> that's a, a very good question because there are some gorgeous ensembles that all of you as soloists are involved in. I think particularly of, of Immenso Yehova, which is such a gorgeous piece. I mean, the chorus, it's like a call and response. Uh, it's almost a liturgical hymn, a ritual hymn where the chorus sings a kind of refrain and, and the four soloists, or is it five at that point? It's, uh, it's, it's, it's Fanena, it's four, it's, Fanena, it's, it's four, but then Zachariah. She's dead already. Yes, oh, that's right, that's right. That's not true. <laughs> no, she's, she hasn't come on stage to die yet. <laughs> I'm dying, but I'm not dead yet. There's a lot of traces of uh, very Because very we pray for you. This is you're not <laughs> at that moment, we are praying for you. But uh, these ensembles must be exciting to sing. It hmm? is. It is. It is beautiful music. It is beautiful. And uh, as uh, for a role of Fanena, beautiful lines which describes that wonderful character. She is not beautiful from outside. She is beautiful inside. And Ver defines that wonderful, refined way to describe the character. And at the end, beautiful prayer, mm-hmm. very sincere, very noble, very spiritual. And uh, we have to mention that uh, perhaps more than other operas, this one, Nabucco, has a lot of prayers. We all have. Every character has a prayer and chorus and all together, which, is, which makes it very, very spiritual. You know, I don't know whether uh, Solera, who was the librettist for this opera, or whether it was the original authors of the French play, because I haven't been able to find the French play and read it, but uh, uh, whether they knew anything about the Bible. But in doing some research about those prayers, there are prayer forms in the Bible. And every form of biblical prayer is in Nabucco, liturgical, um, uh, supplication, lamentation, a petition, they're all there. There's just, I mean, each prayer is a little different. And Verdi is very sensitive to how he presents those prayers. I mean, for lamentation, you can't get better than Va Pensiero, can you? <laughs> Which is so simple, but my God, it really, you know, carries the message. But there's only one problem for a stage director, because the very first time I have to t- tell you the story that I uh, got the assignment to direct Nabucco, and of course I wanted to do a lot of research on the Judaism, the, the Hebrew, the spirit, you know. And so in San Francisco we have a marvelous temple, our Temple Emmanuel, and so and has an excellent cantor who's a superb singer and all that. So I engaged her to be my uh, technical advisor mm-hmm. for all the Hebrew ceremonies and all that. But then, so when we come to the very first scene, and when the bassist then asks the sopranos, <laughs> he says, could you all virgins put on your white veils? <laughs> and the cantor told me, Lotfi, in Tempo we have no virgins. <laughs> 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 so it was a little difficult because anachronism for, number one. <laughs> <laughs> because for a stage director, because because Verdi, of course, is the composer, a lot of the religious uh, prayers and ceremonies border very closely on Catholicism, mm-hmm. you know, and so it's very fascinating, and it's very for for a stage director, it's quite a challenge uh, uh, to to do the right. Thing, and I, I find that for me to, to keep it as simple as possible probably yeah. is the right thing to do, yeah. rather than complicated. Yeah. Um, now to take the onus a little bit off of Richard, and and rather than just ask him direct questions about uh, stepping in for an indisposed colleague, 
I imagine all of you, um, and even as a stage director, Latvi, have stories about stepping in for a colleague who isn't able to make it at the last minute. Um, if anyone would like to share one of those stories, we'd love to hear it. And you don't need to it's name anybody. It's too painful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I see, Ray has a knowing look. Uh, um. <laughs> well, Ian, just, I mean, not even, uh, we've all done it, I've done it, and it's, it's one of those things where it's sort of a double-edged sword. You feel terrible for your colleague who's gone down, however, <laughs> you know, careers have been launched, yeah. you know, this way. Uh, people have gotten opportunities they would have never have gotten, and, uh, you know, um, I had a very fortunate for me and unfortunate for someone else about a year ago with the Boston Symphony and Simon Bocanegra with James Levine. Um, the person that was singing uh, Fiesco took ill and I got to sing two of the three performances with the Boston Symphony, Fiesco, James Levine, mm. wonderful cast, you know. I mean, it was awesome. I, I loved every minute of it and uh, I felt certainly you know, bad for my colleague who was down, but you know, there could be, hopefully not, a day that that could happen to me too. But you know, you you you, you have to concentrate on what's going on at that moment, and, and you know, you never know. You, you might fly in that day. You might spend an hour, two hours with the director. Or the hopefully the we have a you know, hopefully your director's there. But a lot of times, if it's a revival, it's an assistant or. You know, so you go from the, you get off the plane, you go right to a rehearsal room where you work with the pianist for an hour, mm. the conductor, then they rush you over and you work for two hours with the stage director and he goes, now look, now go there, and then you go there. Mm. Oh, then be careful because there's a ballet here and if you don't watch out where you're going, they'll kick your head off. Mm. Great, <laughs> then you go to the costume shop and so by the time the curtain comes, you don't even remember your name, <laughs> let alone what the opera is and what you're supposed to do. But that's you, part of the game. You make it work. Arthur, you're in a fest contract in a house in Germany. Yes. Uh, so I imagine you end up doing this a often? Lot. Yeah. Uh, so far this, this season, uh, approximately 15, and 15 or 16 times uh, for Carmen and uh, for Bohem. Um, but it's also happened to me. I had a pretty severe fever about a month ago, and uh, I also had to uh, cancel three performances. So, so I've had colleagues jump in for me as well. Um, I think the first time it happened to me was probably for me the most. Uh, I'll never forget it because, uh, <laughs> well, I, I got the call uh, in the morning, and I had to go to the next town, which is a couple hours away. Um, I'm in Braunschweig, and uh, the town was Bielefeld, and apparently the tenor had canceled basically that morning he had called and canceled. So I went there and uh, it was Bohem and it was a complete chaos. I mean, they rushed me to a fitting, but I was just wearing basically what I was wearing now. And they said, well, it's a modern production. Why don't you just wear your own jeans? <laughs> 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 so I wore my own, my own jeans, my own shoes. Uh, and um, uh, I just remember having no time to be afraid. So yeah. this was great. <laughs> that there was no time to be afraid. And what was hilarious was I didn't even get a chance to meet the conductor. Uh, but it was a really, really cool guy. Young guy was like 24 or something like that. He's like, yeah, yeah, cool, all right. <laughs> got another tenor. Uh, and then <laughs> and I remember c what they had was they had me staged up on top of a ladder. Um, F at the beginning of the opera, uh, you know, so, and of course the baritone starts singing, Questo ma rosso mio molice, you know, and then I come down and say, Nece li vigi, right? So I come down and, the, and I start singing, and the baritone gives me this look. He's like, Who the hell are you? <laughs> <laughs> nobody, ha nobody had told him that he was, <laughs> that he had another <laughs> and since I was up on a ladder and he was on the other side of stage. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. That Some was guy great. off the street just yeah. walked in. <laughs> it's <laughs> to a, do that happens to be something that happens to me a lot because the very first day I flew into Germany for my, my first job, um, and I wasn't expecting to sing. I was B cast in Rigoletto, and um, they had me to observe the rehearsal. 
when I get to the rehearsal and uh, I'm sitting there in my flip-flops and my shorts and t-shirt because it was an unseasonably warm summer. And uh, uh, suddenly, like, you know, they say, where's the tenor? And the, the, the director starts getting very, very angry, saying, you know, this is uh, unacceptable and everything like that. And it turns out the tenor was still in Berlin. And, um, and also the baritone. <laughs> so basically, in the entire B cast was to go on. And I had only one hour of staging during that day. I mean, I was still jet lagged. So, uh, so I basically kind of had to go on. They had an assistant run back to the apartment to get my shoes, because you're not allowed to do open toes on, uh, open toed shoes on the, on the <laughs> stage. And I got there, and uh, for this particular entrance, he sings "Tamo, Tamo, Ribertilo" to the to the soprano, and the soprano had that same exact reaction that I had in Bohem. <laughs> and we sang for like 30 minutes and rehearsed and all that, and we kissed and all that kind of stuff. And then after the break, uh, after we finished and we had a break, then I introduced myself. I was like, "By the way, I'm Martha." <laughs> so it, it seems to be something that happens a lot. Uh, at least for me, it does. So. Yeah. Well, we've taken the onus off you a little bit, Richard. So now, do you want to tell us a, just a, a, a bit about uh, how this happened? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have but absolutely not, 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 no idea. Uh, <laughs> not from the what, other singer's perspective, of course, but from, from yours. What is it about Bohem? <laughs> I was doing a Bohem up in Scotland, and I had seven tenors. <laughs> we went through them. Yeah, like, but um, no, um, I received a call from Ian. Uh, Tuesday week before last and um, searched all over Houston could not find a single score for Nabucco in all of Houston at oh. any of the music stores <laughs> we have we have three very nice um, classical music stores there's not a single one thank heavens years prior yes I had opened the score I'd looked at the part I'd kind of like said yeah I, it, it's with well within my range of singable I can do this no problem uh, I even purchased a video years ago and and several wonderful uh, uh, CDs, uh, Capuccilli included, mm -hmm. and uh, Maraguera, and I dearly love. So I had, I had, had listened to them years past, but then basically with everything else, uh, wife, children, whatnot, it kind of lives on the shelf. Um, then uh, I finally borrowed, borrowed a score. If you open my score, it says HGO. It says Houston Grand Opera on the inside of it <laughs> with the little pocket where you put the, where you, where you put the card that you're supposed to sign. <laughs> and uh, I just sorry, it's not coming back. <laughs> it, you don't want it back, trust They're me. They're videotaping you, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> You've seen my score. Um, but it's, um, no, it was, it was wonderful. Uh, Richard Beto at, at Houston Grand Opera uh, was able to, he was in the previous, he was a coach pianist there, was able to uh, give me three days, and we, we spent three days, or four days of practicing. And then I flew in last week, and the San Diego Opera has a one phenomenal music staff, many people in it. In fact, they even flew down a gentleman from uh, Paul Harris from San Francisco. He's been working with me daily. So you have to excuse me a little bit. I'm, I'm doing coachings all day with Paul and then the rehearsals in the evening. So I'm just taking me a little bit more to get, get back, into, back into shape here. Um, it, it, but I think, well, I think we spoke earlier. It's had I not <laughs> been where I had, have I not traveled where I had before, I would not be where I am now kind of thing. It's had, it, had I not had the experience of playing the Scottish opera Rigoletto, um, oh, Falstaff, uh, all of the various characters, the, the uh, Traviata, and so many others, I would not feel as comfortable as I do right now stepping into this role. And I think that's one of the biggest things, is the familiarity that you get with a composer and the understanding of where he's going, where he's going to take this. But over and above everything else, it is my wonderful colleagues that have been so supportive throughout the entire thing. And Maestro, the two Maestri, the, our, our wonderful conductor, Latvi, they have been so supportive through this entire endeavor, letting me grow in the role and letting me, um, giving, giving me free reign and yet Kind of like, okay, now, Richard, <laughs> keep the reins on it a little bit. Watch, you know, don't let me go too far. Don't let me go over the edge, which, uh, which is a challenge. And I thank you all so very much for all that help. 
I want to thank our distinguished guests, our panel, and uh, I know you're all looking forward to seeing Nabucco, but it is incumbent upon you to talk to all your friends and tell them about this brilliant piece uh, that will be done, that will be performed and played brilliantly. Come to Nabucco. Thanks a lot for coming. <laughs>